Well, good morning. It's good to see you. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, always great to be back at First Houston. Uh, hard to even understand my own story, my own salvation, and my own call to ministry uh, without the ministry that's taking place here at this church. Uh, so it's always good to be home. While you're turning to Exodus 3, and I would encourage you to do that, so you can see I'm not making anything up today. Um, I don't know if you, and I'm, I'm perfectly, I know who I am, I know who God's made me, but the introductions today were, they were a little one-sided. I don't know if you you saw that, and this was nothing against Doug. It was just like, he, here's a brilliant scientist who invented an element, who did postdoctoral work at the University of Everywhere on Earth, and then, but Matt Chandler's here, and he's been here before. Uh, and so, but like I said, I, I know who I am in Christ. I'm secure. I'm happy in the Lord. I just thought, no one will ever introduce me like that as long as I live, right? They, no one will ever save me. He did his postdoctoral work at, like that sentence is not in my future unless someone gives me one. And then I'll just say I did my postdoctoral work. See, I can't even say it. How can you have a degree if you can't even say it? Uh, let's get to work. I'm rambling now. We don't have that kind of time. Um, there, there are a few things on earth that can be both inviting and terrifying simultaneously. Uh, like you got to kind of pick one of those edges, right? Um, so like a, a, a puppy can be inviting but not terrifying. A lion can be terrifying but not necessarily inviting. And, and yet um, when God finally reveals himself to his people, he finally gives his personal name, he does it through. And if you've got a, a background in Sunday school all the way back to felt boards or all the way up to iPads, uh, you know that God chose to reveal himself through fire. And that's not... That's not non-consequential. There's meaning there because our God, the God of the Bible, the creator of the universe, is simultaneously inviting and terrifying like fire. Um, so if you can imagine a fire in the fireplace and drinking a hot coffee on a cold day, I know it's Houston, we get like four of them a year, uh, and it's cold out there and it's just inviting. Or if you think about um, fires that kind of ravage and burn down communities like we saw in California last summer, like that's a terrifying idea that no matter what we throw at this fire, it's all consuming. And so God, uh, in his giving his personal name to his people, reveals himself through fire, which is both inviting and terrifying. And so uh, I know I'm in Houston, I know a lot of engineers, a lot of, um, I need your outline if I'm going to be able to pay attention. So let me just give it to you. We can all breathe out and then we can get to work. Um, what I want to do is out of Exodus 3, um, show you that God is above us. He's transcendent, uh, but that God is with us. He's eminent. Those are the, the theological terms. Uh, and that in his transcendence and eminence, we figure out who we are versus who he is. And that makes all the difference in our life. So that's my outline. Now let's get to work on it. Let me just read all of Exodus 3. I know it's a lot, but, but it's, uh, it's a pretty epic story. And then we'll dive in. Now, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw uh, that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground." And Moses said, or God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. I have also seen the oppression which the Egyptians oppress them with. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, 
Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children out of Egypt? Then he said, but I will be with you and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his name? Which is a legitimate question. What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you, and this is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. If you're not picking up on that, that's a pretty big deal. If you've studied the book of Genesis, this is how they knew and understood who God was, right? He was the God of Abraham. He was the God of Isaac. He was the God of Jacob. But as far as progressive revelation is going, we're seeing something new here, but he's still tying it to the old, which is something for young bucks to remember. I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. Verse 17. And I promise that I will bring you up out of affliction to Egypt, up from Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pedrites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice and you and the elder, you and the elders of Israel shall go up to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it, and after that he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and for gold jewelry and for clothing. And you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. And so you shall plunder the Egyptians. So what we're seeing here is really the the nature and character of God played into how we define who we are and how we interact with the world. So let's start with his transcendence. We see here um, that God is self-defining, that that God defines who God is, that man does not define who God is. God defines who God is. And you and I live in a day where it is a popular thing for human beings to try to make God in our image rather than understand we've been made in his. It's not uncommon to hear phrases like, well, I think God would. Well, oh, God must, right? It's this idea that, that God would be like us rather than us being made in his image. And, and so this is a kind of madness that's inconsistent with reality. Like God's name, his personal name is I am who I am. My personal name is Matt Chandler, but I've got to add some things to that for it to make sense. I am Matt Chandler, a pastor. I am Matt Chandler, an author. I am Matt Chandler, right? A husband. I am Matt Chandler, a father. I can't say Matt Chandler is Matt Chandler. That didn't make any sense, right? At best, I'm arrogant. At worst, I need some meds. Right, like nobody defines themselves like that because all of us have been defined by external factors. The home you grew up in, it's defined you. The bent of your personality has defined you. Sorrow and joy has defined you. Well, God is other than, that is not how he works. It's God and God alone that says, I am who I am. And, And literally it translates, I be who I be, which is a lot more fun to say. And what the Hebrew is trying to communicate when when God says, I be who I be, is he's saying that I have been who I have always been. I am consistent. You know who's not consistent? You and me. He's saying, I'm different than you. I I be who I be. I have always been this. And, And then he goes on to say, I am who I am, which means God's not shaped by our opinions of him. Right, like the most hardened atheist in the world that shakes his fist at God with this bucket full of facts that is supposedly supposed to mean that he doesn't exist, you know, does nothing to God's godness. You know, like there's nothing you can think about God that actually takes anything away from God. It's not like God could ever be diminished or added to by you. 
And you're like, man, that's, hey, okay, this actually really, really good news. So I be who I be. I have always been and I will always be. I'm consistent in my track record. I am who I am. God isn't shaped by others. And then I will be who I will be. God is the only thing that will matter when all is said and done. And this is how God's introducing himself. This is his, this is his personal name. Your Bible will translate it um, Yahweh, your Bible will translate it. Most often in your Old Testament, you'll just see the Lord in all caps, and that's God's personal name. That's I be who I be. Anytime you see the Lord in all caps. Now, um, th this is significant because this means if I am who I am, that means all of his promises are true. All of his promises are true, right? You make promises you can't keep. Anybody made a promise they weren't able to keep? That, I don't need you to raise your hand. I know the answer, right? It was rhetorical. It's not like, oh, no one? My sermon's blown, right? I, yes, you, you have. You have made promises you can't keep because listen, I want to love you because you're a terrible God. You lack the skill set to be God. Namely, you're not omniscient. You're not omnipotent. You're not omnipresent, which means you are a terrible God. Great guy, just crummy God. Beautiful woman, just really crummy God. But if I am who I am is true, then all his promises can be counted on. Uh, like, look at even the way, I wish we had more time. Look at the way he talks in 16 through 22. Uh, I'm not going to read it again, but he's not guessing. Here's what he says. Go to the elders. Tell them what I just told you to tell them. Go to the king of Egypt. Tell him what I'm telling you to tell. He will not listen to you. He will only be compelled by my mighty hand and I'm going to flex my mighty hand and then he's going to let you go. And he's not only going to let you go, but he's going to let you go with all their stuff. You will plunder them, which is the language of victory. You've got in this conversation between God and Moses a guarantee of God's victory over cosmic darkness forever. That Pharaoh saying, I am Pharaoh, I am the God man, I am the emperor of the most powerful nation the world at this point has ever seen, I have the largest army, the greatest wealth, the most spectacular power, and God's like, yeah, but I am who I am. I'm going to take all your stuff, I'm going to give it to my people, I'm going to drown all of you in, the, in, a, in an ocean that I tell to open up because I am who I am, but nice try, Pharaoh. I appreciate you flexing, but I am who I am. But, but if you notice, like, God's not going, okay, Moses, go to the elders. I'm not sure how they're going to take this. Um, so start with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because they'll know that, but then spring this on them. And then if they listen, because I'm not sure if they will, but if they listen, then go to Pharaoh. And then maybe Pharaoh, listen, I mean, there's going to be like 50 of you guys. There's only one of him. So man, go there and just go, hey, quick, can we head out and worship God? And like, like that's not how God talks. You will go this is what's going to happen. I'm going to break. You're going to plunder. He, he's able to keep his promises because he's not us. He's God. God's godness is something that the people of God have to rally around, marvel in, and rejoice in. Because if we don't, we're going to get caught up in our own abilities and our own talents and our own. And there's nothing but heartbreak and slavery there. Nothing but heartbreak and slavery there. Um, so God's never like maybe or if, like you and I are. So uh, maybe... Maybe this will help. Um, I have learned to never tell my wife what time I'm going to be home. I simply tell her when my last meeting starts, right? Be, because I'm not a good God. And so if I say, and the nature of what I do is, I mean, if Lauren says, what time are you going to be home, baby? And I'm like, well, boo, I'll probably be home about, gosh, I don't know, about 5.30. And then I've got a guy that started at four and right about 5.15, he breaks and it's just snot and tears and my world's burning to the ground. I'm not sure what's going on with my wife. My kid's wilding out. And he's just like, oh, just bearing it. So just vomiting all over my, my desk with brokenness. I can't be like, <sighs> okay, hold up. No, no, I'm sorry. Here, I love you. I'm gonna pray for you. Man, I, I gotta go, bro. Like, let's, we can pick this up tomorrow because here's the thing. If I don't leave right now, both our worlds are going to be burning down. And if we're both on fire, who's going to help who, right? So, so I got to bounce. And so that, that's why I'll just tell Lauren, it, it starts at four. I'll be home as soon as that meeting's over. Why? Because I'm not God. Like, God doesn't talk like I have to talk. God never goes, well, I'm going to kind of start this thing at 4, and then about 5.30, we'll see what happens. Like, God is God. He's other than. He is different than us, but he's not just transcendent and above us. He's also among us and with us. 
And if you don't get both of those and you don't hold the tension of both of those, you're gonna be outside of God's goodness and grace for you on the ground in the everyday in and outs of your life. So if we could boil down the Bible into three words, here's what it would say, God with us. If you open up your Bibles to Genesis 1 and 2, God with us. What happens after we get out of slavery and establish the tabernacle? God with us. What happens when Solomon builds the temple? God with us. What's the incarnation of Jesus Christ but God with us? The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost and makes his home in the soul of the believer, God with us. And then at the return of Jesus Christ, it's God with us forever. The story of the Bible is God with us. He's not just transcendent. He's with us and among us. Look, you can, I know you're like, well, you didn't give us a verse for that. Okay, let's look at it. Love when you're asking questions I plan on answering. Look at verse seven of chapter three. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Remember where we just were? Transcendent, I am who I be, who I be. And now what? I see you, I hear you, I know your sufferings. I'm coming down to save you. I'm coming down to deliver you. He is transcendent, but he is not aloof. He is everywhere at once and knows every hair on your head. He is not a God that is so high and out there that he is detached from your suffering, your loss, your joy, your sorrow, your confusion, your loneliness, your despair. You fill in the blank. I have seen. And I think one of the most comforting sentences in the Bible, and and I'll cut the sentence even shorter than it is in this text, I know. I know. I've seen, I've heard, I know. Those are words of comfort to people who are in, in, a, in a bad way, right? And yet it becomes important for us to make sure that we hold both transcendence and imminence in the right tension. See, if, you're, um, if God is fully above us, if he is only transcendent and, and he's not imminent, then we're gonna live like functional deists. Like, sure, there's a God out there somewhere, but he's not really dialed into me. He's not really paying attention to what I'm doing. Uh, and so that can look a lot of kind of ways. One of the ways that looks in the Bible Belt is just like church attendance that has no real full surrender to Christ during the week. It's like God's just checking in on Sundays like, oh, man, we're doing great. All right. You know, like he's not involved. He doesn't see our hurts. He doesn't see our losses. He doesn't see the difficult marriage. He doesn't see uh, work falling apart. He doesn't see the addiction. He doesn't see, we're just, just kind of checking in, making sure everybody's moral and good. Okay, great. Everybody, all right, great. Loving it. No, no, no. We're not deists. We don't believe that God started this thing into motion and is just hoping it plays out well for him. It's not who we are. It's not what we believe. It's not what the Bible teaches. We believe that to our own peril. But we're not just all on the imminent thing either, right? Because if you reject transcendence and you go imminence, then almost everything's God, right? It, I don't know if everybody saw the movie Avatar uh, by James Cameron, right, with the ponytail and just everything was God. The tree was God and the birds were God and the dinos were God and the aliens were God and the bushes were God and you could plug your ponytail and everybody was God together. That, that's imminence off the rails, right? And that's a real thing. Like if you hear people talk, people will talk that way. Like God is just kind of this ethereal force. He's not an ethereal force. He's a person. He's a spirit. He's the God creator of the universe. He's not in everything. He has created everything and he holds everything together by the word of his mouth. And, and if you only have eminence, then, and, and I'm not dogging or judging anybody, but you should never have a shirt that says Jesus is my homeboy because he's not. Does he love you? Absolutely he loves you. Has he sacrificed greatly for you? Yes. But brothers and sisters, we never want to be kitschy about Jesus. But just to remind you, when he comes back, he's not coming as a six pound, eight ounce baby, right? How's he come back? There's a sword coming out of his mouth, a tattoo on his thigh, and the Bible says the mountains flee out of terror. I don't know how scary you got to be to make mountains run. And we're in Texas, so most of us don't know, like, well, I don't understand. Right, but if you've ever gotten out of him, you've like been in the mountains, like what possible force could show up to make the mountains go, no, 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 we're out. 
the coming of Christ. He even says that those far from him will cry out that the mountains would hide them. That's what's so crazy about the imagery around that text and just how, um, although he has come now, and the good news I'm come to preach today is he hasn't brought condemnation in the world, but salvation from condemnation. But when he comes again, it won't be as a baby in a manger. It'll become uh, as the reigning king of glory and everything will melt in front of him. So we're not just, oh, he's, he's, he's just cute and he's just love, sweet baby G. No, 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 no. He, he is transcendent and he is imminent. He is both. Now, if we can hold those in tension, then that really helps us answer the question I think everybody's having a hard time answering today. Look with me in verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, but I will be with you and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Now, if God is not transcendent or imminent or you pick one of those, then you're kind of forced to kind of create your own identity. You have to answer this question, who am I, uh, with a kind of projected image of yourself that's detached from the purpose for which you exist. Right? You have been existed, you have been created by God for God. If God is not transcendent and imminent, then, then you have to define your reality up and against other things, and that always leads to slavery. Let me give you some of the most popular. Here's some of the most popular who am I answers in 2019 here at First Baptist Church Houston and almost anywhere in the Western world, right? Here, here's identity one. I am in control. I've got it. My family's good. My work's good. Church is good. My kids are good. I, I, I've got it. I am in control. If your kind of base identity is you're the person that has it all together, you're the guy that's in control, you're the woman that's in control, uh, you, you are going to be struggling with anxiety and anger. And you know how I can so boldly say that? Because you're not in control and because you can't be in control and the world's gonna teach you over and over and over again that you're not, and that's gonna to lead to a lot of anxiety. And then when, when you double down, because that's, if you're a control freak, you double down. Like when the world goes, you're not in control, you're like, oh yes I am. I mean, even though you're getting beat down by the fact that you're a crummy God, like control freaks double down when it gets exposed, they can't control things. So if you've got a control freak and they're running an event and things start to go bad on the event, they, they like double down. If, if you're a controlling personality and you're in a marriage and things aren't going your way, you just double down. You ratchet down. I'm going to control even harder when the world shows me I'm out of control. So what does that lead to? Anxiety. When's that going to happen again? It leads to anger. Why won't you just do what I say? This is a faux identity that enslaves you. If that's not the identity, it oftentimes can be I am what I do or I am what I own. If I'm in control leads to anxiety and anger, I am what I do or I am what I own leads to depression and debt or depressive debt sometimes, right? Because if I am what I do, then, then I have to always be doing. I mean, I have to always be doing, not only do I always have to be doing, but I always have to be doing a little bit better than I did it last time. And, it, and if I am what I do at work, then anybody who gets a promotion past me or when work ends or when things go rough at work, the very core of who I am, fragile as it is, begins to fall apart and, and I start to vanish like Thanos just snapped his fingers. All right, is that, is that too soon? Yeah, ask your friend who Thanos is. Uh, we'll talk about it later. Right now, he, here's, here's another one. Um, and, and I don't know. I don't know how to explain this one other than just to start to explain it and hope I don't get lost in the illustration. Um, when I was in seventh grade, um, if you failed a test, you know what happened? You failed a test. Like nobody cared about your self-esteem when I was a seventh grader. They were like, well, you're irresponsible. You should have studied. You failed. But then in eighth grade for the second time, Everybody started to be concerned about how kids felt about themselves in regards to their grades, in regards to their lives. It was like, oh, you, you bombed, you made a 32 on your test and you misspelled your own name. Oh man, that's, we don't want you to feel bad about yourself. So here's that, we're going to let you, we're going to let you take that test again, except here are the answers this time. 
Oh, you made a 73. How do you feel about that 73? Can you live with a C? No. You know what? Let's do that test one more time. And oh, you're late with your homework. You know, don't worry about it. We'll just take five points off, turn it in later. And what this did on top of the self-esteem movement, which has all of us telling our kids they're the best thing ever, is set them up for an entitlement mentality that's going to make them angry and embittered and entitled as they get older. I, I want to just be so bold as to say this to you. Look right at me. This is me in love. You're average. <laughs> By definition, you're just average, right? We're not all superstars. Now, that's what our, our folks have been telling us and, and other people have been telling us, right? You are amazing. You are, the only reason you're amazing is you've been made in the image of God. That's it. You've been made in the image of God, and that is spectacular. But overall, if you would get in your mind, I'm just kind of average, then life's going to be amazing for you. <laughs> but if you buy into the lie that everything's going to be easy for you, and that there's no pain in life if you love Jesus and you play your cards right, you are going to grow entitled and angry, and I think you're going to blow up your life eventually. Uh, my sister lives in Taiwan, and they describe this generation that, that feels entitled as strawberries. They're just so tender, and you, know, you just don't want to bruise them, and you, know, you can't drop them or they explode and be you know, like little strawberries. I think we're saying snowflake here, but I think that has political connotations, and I'm not getting in that fight here with you guys. I could say some things, like Greg clean it up, but I love him. I'm not doing it. Um, and, and so there's this... <laughs> There's this kind of softness. And so what ends up happening is if you grow up with your mom and your dad and your teachers and everybody around you going, you're really special and you're really incredible. And man, everybody's lucky to have you in their lives. And marriage is amazing if you do it right. And you should have plenty of money. And everything. I mean, imagine what it's like when you actually have to live life and step outside of that fairy tale. Imagine how disappointed you are when you when you, when you get into marriage and you realize, oh, there's two sinners living in this house and I'm one of them. <laughs> but, but if we'll think about it, when that happens, whose fault is it? It's not my fault, because I'm awesome. <laughs> it's not my fault, I'm special. You know who it is? It's my wife's fault. It's my boss's fault. It's my neighbor's fault. It's this church's fault. It's this, and, and you can't ever own the fact that you're a sinner in need of grace because you're such a strawberry that, that you can't be bruised by a world that's built to bruise you because sin has entered the chaos. Are you tracking with me? So that's an identity, right? I'm not gonna struggle. Everything's always gonna be awesome. I mean, think about how often you've just been in the clutches of a dark season and somebody at church is like, how are you doing? And you just immediately, I'm praise his name. I'm great, brother. Right? I mean, this is, this is a projected image. It enslaves us. It makes us feel entitled. And it'll lead to self-destruction because you've got to have somebody to blame because you certainly can't be at fault because you're amazing. And I just want to love you to go, you might be amazing, but you are amazingly average. <laughs> might be the first person to ever tell you that. I'm willing to bear the brunt of it. Now, here's, what's, here's what I want to point out. I think this is so fascinating. Honestly, the, the point of the text in a, a very real way. So Moses says... Who am I that you would send me into Egypt to have this conversation? And you would think at this moment, God would kind of remind Moses of some things that are true. What, Moses? Hey, you speak Egyptian, right? Like who else on the mountain speaks Egyptian? You know they lay out of Pharaoh's palace, right? We should seal team six you, just send you in there. Cacao, let it be over. Brother, you know the laws of the land. You know where the soldiers, you know everything about Egypt. Moses, who else but you? And God doesn't do any of that. Did you, do you remember the text? Who am I? And God's response is, I'm going with you. <laughs> I just love that. What kind of talent do I have? Oh, that's not, what question are you asking? I'm going. <laughs> what do you expect me to, Shh, I'm coming. I don't, why do you keep making this about you, Mo? You're, you're terrible, right? You've been, you're like 80 years old. You've been up in the mountains for like 60 years talking to a burning bush right now. I'm coming. I've got this for you. I'm going to make this happen. And, and this moment of who am I, but I will go from the I am who I am makes all the difference in our lives because he's beginning to root our identity in his identity. Who am I? I'm coming. Where you go, I'll be. I will be in you. You will be in me. So that now my life is defined not by my gifts and talents, not by my wins and losses, not by my abilities, whether I'm average or uh, extraordinary, but I'm his. 
He is in me and I am in him and all that is available to the sons and daughters of God has been made available to me and not because I'm a pastor and not because I got out of addiction or not because I did, but because I'm his. So you can see there's no boast in the kingdom of the cross, right? It's only, I mean, this whole kind of Christian Hollywood, amazing celebrity Christians is nonsense. The, the kingdom of God has moved forward by faithful laymen and laymen in the workplace, being gospel lights, opening up their tables and homes and sharing the gospel with friends and family members. Not about like super preachers, right? Outside of the enlightenment and a couple pretty, or outside of the revivals, the great awakenings, that, that's rarely the way this has gone. It's you being faithful where you are. That's God's big plan. And you're like, well, you don't know me. You don't know my story. Here's what's great. I, I don't have to because I know I am who I am. He didn't need you to be awesome. In fact, isn't his glory seen all the more by how kind of average we are? How God moves through those who are just kind of barely getting by? I mean, here's what I would would bet. I have not read the policy and procedure manual at First Baptist Houston. Here's my guess. Moses couldn't get a job here. (laughs) Moses had put in his resume, and it's a pretty legit resume. I, I led... Three million people for 40 years through the wilderness and got right up to the promised land and then I died on this mountain, but uh, I'd like to spend my last couple of time bits with you. Uh, Wouldn't you on that background check have some questions? Okay, real quick. You murdered a guy? Like with your bare hands, you, you choked the life out of him? Okay, and then you fled. So you've never actually paid for that. So like, are they still looking for you? Like if we put you over home groups here, are, are the cops gonna show up? and arrest you? Are we going to be on Channel 13 News for giving you refuge after you murdered a guy with your hands? But who's being called right now? He can't speak, right? He stutters. He, he's terrified to step into his destiny. He, like God finally gets frustrated with him. He's like, I can't, I can't, I can't. He's like, why do you keep making this about you? Of course you can't. That's kind of my point. I can. If you'd ever get over yourself, think how magical this could be. And I'll, I'll put this, this illustration out, and then I'll conclude by reading one more text. Uh, let's say you and I are in London, uh, and, and we want to go see the Queen at Buckingham Palace. So it's just kind of our thing. I don't know. It's just our deal. We want to see the Queen. We want to kind of see where she lives. We want to see the bedroom. We want to see the bathroom. Like, how do royals do all that? We want to check it out. So we go up to Buckingham Palace, and we, we knock on the door. I guess there's a door. I've never been able to get past the gate. Multiple attempts. Failed every time. And... <laughs> Um, get up to the door and the guard answers, you know, hey, who, what are you doing? I was like, ah, so glad somebody answered. Um, really like to hang out with the queen today. Not sure what she's got going on, but I'm, I'm all the way from Dallas. That is not, that's not, that's a flight. Uh, so I'd like to visit with the queen. I don't know what she's doing for tea. I've heard that's kind of awesome here. So if I could do tea with the queen and then I've heard maybe you guys have secret rooms. It's Buckingham Palace. I'd like to see those secret rooms. And then where do you guys keep all the gold and jewels? Because I'd really like to see that. Okay, sir, I'd like to ask you again, who are you? And I'm like, well, I'm Matt Chandler. No, no, I mean, who are you? I'm like, yeah, I, I said, I'm Matt Chandler. And I want to hang out with the queen. I'd like to do tea. I'd like to see the royal bathroom. I'd like to the jewels. I, I don't, did, did I... Did you not hear me? Did you not? Like, here's the thing. I got no access. None. They're not letting me in. And the same would have been true five years ago of a woman named Kate Middleton. Had Kate come to the door, I'm like, tot, tot, tot. They opened the door and Kate would have said, hey, um, I'd like to see the queen. I'd like to see where the jewels are. Uh, I'd like to see the bedroom and the bathroom. I'm just always interested how the royals do all that. And uh, I would, she said the same thing I did. That about, little girl, you better get off this you know, might even whacked her one or something and, and, and she'd been gone. But now she walks right up to that door and, and she's not Kate Middleton. She is Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Cambridge. And she didn't ask to come in. She walks in when she wants. Why? Because she's with him. So what's happening, what you're seeing happening in this text about our identity and how it's tied up in God's godness is that you and I get to say, I'm with him. Uh, I'm with him. So all that's available to him is now available to me. And this is the point of Romans 8 when it says, who can separate us from the love of God? What's our response? I'm with him. Can nakedness, famine, sword, suffering, disease, death, angels, demons, are you kidding? I'm with him. 
that all that is his is mine in Christ. I am in him and he is in me. And maybe you're like, brother, I have no, you have lost me. I don't know how you got from Yahweh, Jehovah up to Jesus. Those aren't the same people. And I'm glad you asked that or had that insight. Again, it's my last point. John 8, 53 through 59 says this. This is a conflict between Jesus and uh, the Pharisees. And I know it's a conflict because they start the conversation like this. Is it true that you have a demon? So you, you don't ever lead with that if you're not trying to start a fight, right? Like if you're in home group or Sunday school and you're just like, hey, before we get started, are you possessed? Like you're starting something there, right? Now I know we're tempted to ask that question of a lot of people, uh, but they ask Jesus that question and, and, and here's what they say. We're gonna pick up the dialogue in 53. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him, I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. You can see this thing's heating up. But I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and he was glad. And the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, what's it say? I am. And if you're not picking up on what he's saying, notice that the very next phrase has them picking up rocks trying to kill him. So who is the I am who I am? Jesus, God in the flesh among us, coming into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world from condemnation. And, and Jesus has this sermon, it's, it's one of my favorite sermons in the Gospel of Matthew where he looks out at the crowd and they're worn out and they're exhausted and they're weary trying to keep up with all the religious nonsense of their day and, and they're broken and they've got nothing left in the tank and he extends this invitation that should baffle the imagination. He says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. And if you've been living out of a faux identity, you've been living out of a projected image of yourself, that invitation is to you. So see, oftentimes to protect ourselves um, as churchgoers, we like to take that text and think he's talking about heroin addicts, right? We're just like, I mean, that, that's a great sentence for those who have really made a mess of their lives. Not, not me, I'm a successful businessman and I got a beautiful wife and all my kids love Jesus and I didn't even use my alarm this morning. Christ himself woke me up to spend time with me so I don't even know. But when that's your projected image, then you're internally thin and fragile and you're anxious and angry. You're depressed or hollow and so that word from Jesus, yes and amen, to the most broken and least of these, I just think we get a little off when we think we're not among them. You overwhelmed with anxiety right now because, because man, you are trying to hold together this image of you and you just know you're gonna be found out to be a fraud at any second. Well, here's the invitation. Come to me, you don't have to do that. See, I just think God's godness is just such a gift of grace because it means I, I don't have to be any of that. I don't have to know any, everything because he does. Uh, I don't have to solve everything because he does. I don't have to fix anybody because he does. I don't have to conquer anything because he has. Right? Like what I get to do is just rest in his finished work. I get to just be me in, in all of my shortcomings and all of my strengths. I get to just be me. I don't have to shore up and pretend that I'm more than I am. I can just happily go, oh, yeah, I'm really terrible at that. Like, you don't ever want me to do that. You don't want me anywhere near that. But I can do this really well, but just keep me away from this. And then you just get to rest. You get to be his. And that's so much better than pretending to be more than you are. I would remind you of this, Christian. Jesus knew what he was buying on the cross of Jesus Christ. You are not surprising him in your struggle right now. 
What, you're wrestling with doubt. You're, you're still struggling around with some addiction. You're still falling short and messing up often. You, you really think like you're surprising God? Like 2,000 years ago, Jesus was like, this is a great idea. And now in 2019, he's like, oh man, now that I see this brother straight up, I regret everything. <laughs> That's not how this works. Jesus was publicly crucified, outing all of us as publicly in need of a savior. Like the public death of Jesus and his resurrection, which we'll celebrate next weekend, is a reminder that all of us have fallen short. He did it publicly to out all of us. So it doesn't matter how neat you've made your outside world look, the reality is outside of Christ and rest in him and finding identity in him, it's a house of cards. So maybe you're not tired enough yet. Maybe you still gotta, you're just robust right now at projecting that image. But maybe by the grace of God, you're finally tired. Maybe some things at work, maybe some things at home, maybe some other kind of cracks in the armor have started to occur. And maybe that's why the Lord just brought me today to remind you that Jesus, the I am who I am, has said, come to me, I'll give you rest. You don't have to be all this. You don't have to fix everything. You don't have to be strong enough. I'll be strong enough for you. I'll be strong enough for your family. I'll be strong enough for your work. I'll be strong enough for that wound that's deep in your heart about, will I ever be good enough? I'll be good enough for you. So this is the invitation. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Even as I've looked around the room, just seen some old friends and um, some, some other acquaintances. And I thank you that you've put us here together today. Uh, by your grace, and you've allowed your word, of, your word to bear its weight on us. I, I thank you that I, I pray that it's read us more than we've read it. And I just ask this morning that you'd grant freedom uh, to those in bondage. I think we have a tendency to think about those categories outside the walls of the church, and yet how often are they true inside the church? And so where brothers and sisters of mine feel stuck, feel trapped, feel overwhelmed, feel like they just can't do it anymore. Just pray by your grace, you give them the strength to know that you know that, that you're offering something better. You're not inviting them to try harder, to do more. You're asking them to surrender fully into what you have fully accomplished. Forgive us where we feel like we've got to add to your work. And so I just know, and I know there's young men and women in here already starting to build a life based on a projected image. And I pray that you would confront them today before they hit 40 and 50 and the collateral damage of that is extensive. And I pray for my 40 and 50 year old brothers and sisters in this place, God, just that maybe finally they're getting tired enough. That's not a midlife crisis, that's a projected image crisis. And I just pray that you'd crush that and you'd draw them into yourself. And for my brothers and sisters, even in their 80s and 90s, that God has not finished with them yet. That God has a call on their lives. It's, they're here. They, they've got life. They've got breath in their lungs. And, and where maybe there's a temptation to, because of that stage of life, to pretend to be more, I just pray that you'd wreck that and you'd allow their humility to be the thing that they teach us with. Pray a blessing over this church. Pray for these men and women. Just pray for courage. In just a moment, I'll say amen, uh, and we'll begin to conclude our service. But here's the way I want to encourage you. Um, if, if while the word was sung today, while the word was preached today, uh, the Holy Spirit did what's called conviction. You should never look at conviction as something awful. It's actually an invitation into life. To feel conviction is to, to be born again. It's an invitation by Jesus for you to come in deeper to the life he has for you. And if you felt that, if God's exposed in you sin, if he's exposed in you these faux identities, if he's exposed in you, man, I'm a control freak, and we always joke around about that, but it's not funny. Or you kind of joke around that, oh, I've always got to be put together, and I've always got to look like I have everything together, and, and God's exposed that, because it's not funny, it's exhausting. What would it be like for you to take a step of faith and come and just be prayed over by the brothers and sisters that are around this room? I, this is a safe place for you to not be okay. You tracking with me? Like, I, I wouldn't invite you to share your heart-level struggles with people I thought would weaponize it and use it against you. So this is a safe place. These are safe people, if you're a guest today, for you to have some struggles that you want to invite Jesus into. And so I wouldn't just encourage you. I'm going to say amen in just a moment, and then we're going to sing a little bit. But there will be men and women. You should move towards them. You should be eager to embrace the rest that Christ has offered to you, especially if you're weary and heavy laden. 
Father, bless these men and women. Bless this church. We love you. Our confession is we want to love you more than we do. We'll need your help for that. Give us courage now in confession. Give us courage now in seeking prayer. And it's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen.